good to be at a DrupalCon where there's no like pressure before release. It is, <laughs> it is different, a totally different experience, actually. All right, so um, hi to my session. Um, I'm gonna talk about testing JavaScript. Um, sorry, to do something. There we go. Um, um, so I'm wondering here who in the room like tests their stuff, what they build for their clients, what they build for modules, what they build, there we go. So it's pretty much everyone. So you are aware, no? <laughs> well, maybe you should, you should do as well. Some. Some, okay, that's a good Some idea already. Some yeah, okay, <laughs> I see. What kind of tools do you use there? Who is aware of simple test? Like, a bit, little bit less. Um, yeah, who, who used um, something like Behead for their client stuff? Okay, there we go, 50%, that's good. Um, yeah, and I'm wondering why do other people not do it? Um, but yeah, well, I, it seems to be that you at least don't have to be convinced about it, that's good. So a few words about myself. Uh, I'm Daniel Wiener, not Wiener. Um, <laughs> um, um, I'm a Drupal core contributor since a while. Uh, I work mainly with uh, chapter three and a little bit tech one. Um, and in general, I'm curious. I'm a curious person, so I really like to learn something new. Um, uh, all right. So I have to admit something, we are ignorant. Um, we think we are actually good developers or we are good site builders or something, and the stuff we actually build works, but I would assume it's actually not the case. We change something and then something else in some other system somewhere breaks. So uh, we need testing in order to actually know that stuff is working. Um, that's not only the case for like our Drupal ordinary site building or something, but it's also true for our JavaScript. Um, like <coughs> these days, people build much richer UIs using JavaScript. Uh, it's coming like a lingua franca, kind of like Latin. It used to be in ordinary language. Ja JavaScript these days is everywhere. It's not only on the front end, it's on the back end. It's used even for CLI scripts. Um, uh, so it's in general really good to know how you can test your JavaScript. So here's a, some quotes you certainly saw. It worked when I tested it. Um, it has a couple of like dimensions, this quote. It not only has a, this dimension of your computer or the way how you set up stuff, it also has the dimension of uh, that there are different browsers involved. Maybe some JavaScript works in one browser, but then in IE, I don't know. It's not pitching about IE, it's just an example. <laughs> Because Edge is actually pretty good. Um, um, different browsers might behave differently. Maybe we use some, or some custom um, APIs from some browsers um, and you want to know whether stuff works. Another thing which is really important these days is mobile browsers or mobile phones versus notebooks. The fact that our viewport, the size of the screen changes um, totally has an effect in the way how stuff works. For example, you know, buttons could be not uh, accessible or buttons could be too big or stuff like that. Small things, but small things for us in quote because they are easy to fix, but it's really making a difference. Um, and it's stuff which breaks all the time because um, mobile first, for example, is, is hard, um, I, would just, I would assume. <laughs> um, yeah, there's the other thing, it, works la it worked last month so yeah, we, <laughs> right? I mean, we have some kind of system somewhere. It works, we'd manually tested it and then like, you know, the, you tweak this little setting somewhere and then like your whole thing explodes. I don't know, your, your shopping cart on your site is at some point cached. And I don't know, you cannot add any items anymore because there's some caching. For example, just come up with some random example. So. Um, yeah, we, we also want um, to ensure that there are no regressions introduced. Um, that's called regression testing. Um, of course, we also want that for our core JavaScript, for example, um, in order to ensure that this continues to work, and especially because we need some kind of flexibility in, in order to innovate. Because when we know that stuff is working, we can change something. Otherwise, we don't change it because we don't want to risk anything. 
Um, there are a couple of more problems. Um, I would like to stress out the second one, new members come into the community. If you are new into the system and you don't know how it works, it can be pretty hard. Drupal is a beast. Um, it is so big and it's getting bigger and bigger. I mean, after you listen to the Dries note, like there was no like simple thing in there. It got like, you know, like, I mean, preview seems to be like the simplest one of his suggestions actually. So um, in order to like keep up with that, we need some way to enable new people to also do something. And one way is to basically document the system using tests. Um, so if someone new comes in, they can see, okay, this specific thing on Drupal works like that because the tests kind of describe how they are, uh, how it's supposed to work. And then they can make changes because they know the tests are still working. So here's like my theory about testing. that I couldn't center that thing. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but yeah. But it's an SVG, so yeah. Um, so um, here are three types of testing, or like, so, well, some kind of types of testing you can do. Let's start at the top, end-to-end -end slash functional slash regression, whatever testing. There are many words for everything. End-to-end -end testing describes the idea to have an entire site test something like um, clicking on a link, logging in, posting a comment, and ensuring that the comment appears. This is really like what, and it tests a lot of things, but uh, on the other hand, it has the disadvantage that it doesn't really help to know where the problem is. When something breaks, like you don't know which subsystem might have the problem because it's involving every sus subsystem. So if you go further down the stack, let's say to integration testing, then you are, have a smaller scope in which you know maybe where they are, the bug could be. So what is integration testing? Uh, integration testing is uh, testing how several units or components or whatever of your system work together. Um, in Drupal this would be, for example, you create some content via the API, uh, save the content and ensure that some kind of, I don't know, some view for example returns them as a result. And uh, the bottom is uh, our unit tests. Unit tests is the idea or the art of testing just a specific thing, just, just that thing and just for itself. Um, and in an ideal world, we would have kind of a pyramid where we have a lot of unit tests which also fail if we introduce a bug then more, uh, like fewer integration tests and like even fewer end-to-end -end tests um, in order to not have like maintenance costs for our tests. So here's a state of testing in Drupal 8.1. Um, we have uh, unit tests. Um, you see the unit test case. I'm wondering whether ever laser pointer, but I don't have one anyway. Um, so there's unit test case, uh, which is basically PHP based unit testing. Um, um, it provides you some helper methods um, to deal with Drupal, like, I don't know, set up some configuration or something. Um, you should certainly check it out, but there is nothing for JavaScript so far. Um, then there are, uh, there are integration tests. Uh, we call them kernel tests because um, our system, um, when it boots up, it, there's a thing called kernel, which it's kind of like a Linux kernel. It starts Drupal. And kernel tests allow you to really easy, like create stuff via the API. Uh, but if you think about JavaScript, there could be like a similarity where you have like um, HTML already on your site. Uh, and JavaScript running, um, and you just click around, but you don't have an actual site underneath. Just testing all the JavaScript together, but without an actual site. There's, though, so far, nothing in Drupal itself uh, to support you to do that. And then there was end-to-end -end testing. There it looks a little bit better. Um, we have there are three different systems, actually, or it's kind of two. So we have a browser test base that's, uh, so let's start with simple test. 
that still exists from 2007 and 6. Um, um, that's still the thing you should use if you don't want to risk anything. And then there's browser test base, which is doing the same. It installs it, Drupal. You can create content there, doing HTTP requests, I don't know, submitting forms, uh, and then checking the output. Uh, but it's based upon PHP unit rather than simple test, which enables cool stuff like, um, you know, integration with Jenkins out of the box or using your IDE in order to execute those tests, which is really cool, um, and uh, other kind of stuff. Um, and finally, there's JavaScript test base, um, which is a way to test JavaScript uh, using PhantomJS inside um, like a PHP unit based <coughs> test. I will show some examples later how you can do that. Um, um, yeah, here's a quick overview over other kind of end-to-end -end technologies. Um, there's a thing called BHAT. Um, a lot of you already know about it. It is a tool to define how your website should work in a language of your client. Um, it allows your client to speak in their domain language what they want. So, so for example, if you are a bank, you maybe uh, have a different language than the usual Drupal people. Um, they don't talk about entities, I guess. They rather talk about, uh, I don't know, accounts and um, transfers and money or something like that. Um, you should certainly check it out for like sites, for, your cu for custom sites, for custom projects. Um, it's often used together with Selenium. Um, Selenium is basically a way to control browsers. Um, so you can start up a Firefox instance and then test your site inside this Firefox instance. So you can actually open up the Firefox and see how the browser behaves. So you can actually watch a, a user doing something, which is pretty good for debugging purposes, actually. Um, and then there's Casper.js. Um, once you have like one more JavaScript on your site, you realize that it's hard to test. So Beard is PHP based. So if, if you do a lot of JavaScript stuff, then it's hard to communicate between the PHP and the JavaScript in order to test something. And Casper.js solves that by being JavaScript first. So um, you basically already, you are in the language of JavaScript already. And they can also like go on sites, click stuff, submit forms and stuff like that. And then finally, we have now in Drupal, um, browser test base and JavaScript test base to do this kind of testing. And it's a new feature of 8.1, which is another cool thing that we can innovate actually now between ma uh, major releases. Um, so yeah, a quick, uh, I will show an example how browser test base works so you can apply it on your own projects or contract modules or something, uh, or core patches. Um, it is new since Super 8. Um, it has uh, terminal support and PHP storm support and it's based, based upon PHP unit. Let's just have a look at an, an example. So um, you start with um, adding a file to the, so here's a module for example, and there's like a test directory and you have a source directory and then a functional directory and inside there you place your tests. So for example, example test.php, um, you define a class which extends this browser test base. You say, okay, which modules do I want to have? In this case, the examples module, um, which really exists. Um, and uh, then you can define your test. Um, here in this test, we create a user, logs it in and we log it in uh, then we go to a specific page, test slash page, um, and check whether we get a 200 back. Really simple test, um, nothing fancy is going on here. And then finally we check whether some text appears on that page. Um, the interesting thing is like, um, you can write it like that and then execute it via PHP Storm directly without leaving like the context of doing something. You don't have to go to the simple test UI in Drupal, for example, so you, don't, you cannot distract <coughs> yourself that easy anymore. Um, yeah. Um, there's a couple of things you can do in those tests. Um, in the setup method, you can create like content or configuration you need for the test. 
um, it's similar to simple test. You can tuple get stuff to, uh, which basically is a get request to, to click on a link or something. You can click on a link actually. You can submit forms uh, and, you, and you can check a couple of things like uh, are there a couple of elements, CSS. So you can use CSS in order to check on your site whether something appears. So for example, this means that the view has three elements or three results. Um, you can also check that form elements exist and yada, yada, yada. Um, it's just an overview. This uh, uh, web asset here, which we've created, has, I don't know, 50 or something helper methods for you. And we also extend it in Drupal, so there's a hell of a lot of things there. The cool thing is, because a browser test base is based upon Mink. Um, Mink is a browser abstraction layer, so um, you can basically communicate with Mink, uh, and it can uh, deal with either a PHP-based browser, so like a fake browser, or like PhantomJS, which is a, a headless browser, which runs um, pretty quickly, or you can even communicate with Selenium, so a real browser. Uh, which is really nice because we can run our tests already in all browsers if we want to, if we set up it correctly on uh, the test board. Um, so how do you run actual tests? You start with copying phpunit.xml.dist, that's a file in Drupal, to phpunit.xml, and uh, then you adapt three lines, it's at the top of the file, um, the first one is the base URL, so where's your actual Drupal site. Uh, the second one, the database, so the database credentials. And the final one is um, a, a directory where Drupal puts some verbose outputs, so like some loggings for each page you visited. So you can then afterwards see which HTML was on those pages. And once you have that, once you, have that you can start uh, running those tests and uh, um, yeah, don't worry about it anymore. Um, Let's have a look at how JavaScript test base works. Um, JavaScript test base is also using Mink. So it's basically really just using a different backend for Mink and, and that's it, uh, which is really cool um, because it's really helpful. PhantomJS itself um, is our um, backend in that way. It's kind of a browser, but without any visual <coughs> representation. It is, it's running in the background um, like in your console or in your terminal. Um, and, but it still allows you, for example, to take screenshots of what actually happens. And you can also like attach a debugger um, and check what your JavaScript is doing, um, which is good. So let's have a look at a JavaScript test. Um, the interesting thing, it looks really the same. Um, instead of putting it into the functional directory, we put it into functional JavaScript so and again, we put it into test source functional JavaScript and then the file name test.php. Um, we say which modules we want, this time tool by a node. This is an example of tuple call itself. We log in a user, we go to a certain page, we click on a link. Here we click on a link and then we check whether it's visible or not. So you probably know the toolbar in Drupal where you can see like a, a menu on the left side and you click on there and then it disappears. And that's what we check here. Um, so this is kind of working as expected. Um, the browser in the background executes that kind of operation. So the clicking and then we do asset element not visible so that checks whether the element is there. And then it communicates with the browser again and uh, uh, checks what's going on. So let's have a look how this actually works. So Here's an example. Um, so we start phantom.js using this command. Um, don't be scared. Um, that's, it, you just need to copy it once. And uh, it's documented on a change record. It's documented in a readme inside Drupal itself. So uh, don't be worried. Yeah, there you could uh, actually specify a different um, window size if, if you want to emulate uh, a mobile browser. So. You start that, and uh, then in the second screen at the bottom, we start at some point all the tests we have in Drupal at some point. So it starts, so uh, you need to specify dash c core, which it's just 
configuration, you just type in that command and don't worry about it. And here at the top, we see what's going on. Let's quickly um, stop. Um, so what you see here at the top are the commands phantom.js gets. Um, so here you see the command clear cookies and uh, reset. So what happens is that we have a phantom.js instance and we have um, like the PHP and the PHP um, installs the Drupal site, does something and uninstalls the Drupal site. But in the meantime, the, the browser still stays there. And in order to not cause any data um, problems or like data which is still in the client, we need to, for example, remove all the cookies. We need to remove like local storage and all the information which is statically stored in the browser. And by that we communicate with um, PhantomJS using those commands. And at some point you see a little bit more going on. Let's see, should happen in a while. Uh, yeah, that's where we actually send like um, HTTP requests and like clicking links and uh, stuff like that. And yeah, and then at the end, um, you see that the tests, so we have three tests in the, this example uh, and it takes 22 seconds, um, which is eight seconds per test, which is okay-ish, but does it scale? That's the question. Drupal has 10,000s of tests. If you would calculate that, um, that could be easily ours. Um, so there we go. Here's uh, the summary of what we saw. Um, is this is the command you need to run them. Uh, yeah, this is um, the output then, and you can specify a couple of things to PHP unit. You can either provide like a file name, so this is like a full file name to a test file, and with that you run just a specific test file, or just a specific test, and, but you can also run them all. So you can specify, for example, a directory, and then it tests all tests inside that directory. So why, why do you have to run it as the web server user? Uh, oh, good question. Um, so um, we run it as web server user because um, um, we, for example, we uh, write some files, like when you save a, a file or something, um, we want to ensure that the actual site is then also able to read those files. Um, yeah, it's basically uh, what the test bot is also doing. Um, yeah. Does it make sense for you? Yeah, exactly. That's why you don't never have that kind of problem. Yeah. But otherwise, like, if, for example, um, the test like creates the file directory, files directory, um, and then if you then like in the actual site upload a file, then this actual site need to be able to write to that to that directory. So it's easiest to just run the tests as the web uh, user. Um, um, so. Here's a, Before yeah, there, oh yeah, there, sure. Is, is there a teardown method? Oh yeah, totally, there's a teardown method you can uh, implement in order to uh, clean up stuff like on the file system or something. Um, that's totally possible, yeah. The, the database too? Um, so we, in Drupal, we implement the idea to install Drupal, do all our stuff, and uninstall, or, and then drop the database, basically. Okay. So that's slower but it's also removing like hassle from developers. Um, yeah, whether you want to do that? I mean, for Drupal it totally makes sense because we have hundreds of tests, so in case they would interfere, they would certainly interfere in so at some point. For custom projects it might not make sense for specific <laughs> use cases, but we handle that automatically, but um, because it's based upon PHP unit, or, or like on PHP class hierarchy, um, you can override that behavior and maybe import always the same database from some database dump if you really want to. So, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, just ask. Um, so um, here's a question. Why do we actually use PhantomJS and why do we not use like an actual browser like Firefox? And uh, the, the re reason is actually quite simple. It's a headless browser, so it doesn't actually have to do a lot of things as a normal browser, so it's like much faster, it's like two times faster or something. 
um, that then leads to less resources on the test spot, for example. Um, potentially, it's, it may be, though, it has some disadvantages. For example, uh, because it's headless and because you don't have an actual browser, um, it is harder to debug because you don't see what's going on or not that easy. Um, when we would use Selenium, um, for example, and an actual browser, that could be easier. So maybe it's up to discussion whether we want to keep PhantomJS um, actually, and especially the way how we implemented it. Um, yeah. Another, in general, problem with end-to-end -end testing, so that's all end-to-end -end testing, what we saw so far, is that it's way too slow. Uh, it's super boring, like if you run five tests and you need a minute, then you are certainly on Twitter. Um, like, there's no way around that. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, another problem is uh, that it tests too much. So if you test the entire system, um, you don't know where the problem is. If you just test a specific thing and that fails, you know the problem is in that specific thing. Um, it's also error prone. Um, for example, we saw before that we used like CSS selectors. So what happens if you change CSS selectors? Boom, the tests break. Um, and the other, the last point, the, feed, the feedback cycle is way too slow. Um, like in Drupal Core, we have like thousands of tests and they need, I think currently it's like just 20 minutes, but we are using like an infinite uh, fast hardware and I think 19 or is it 15, I don't know, parallel processes in order to run them all. Um, how many? 32. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, so, it's even more. So yeah. Um, because it's because it's uh, well, it's distracting people, and it's. You know, like, why is the problem that we're using so much hardware? Um, because it costs money. Because it costs money. Who's money? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, Drupal's money. Um, in a way, it could be. I don't know. It could be invested in something else. I don't know how much it actually is, but like, just imagine if we would actually. Um, so we we have a test suite which is using a lot of unit testing. Uh, if we, like, I don't know how many unit tests we have, but in case that would be like uh, simple tests or like browser test base as well, uh, that could easily, like, I don't know, times five that in, in money and time. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the solution to, to that is to use unit testing, which, so what is unit testing? Unit testing is, to just test a specific system instead of everything. Like, that basically means we would, you would not install the site, but you would rather load just a specific JavaScript file, execute a function, and check the output. Um, so yeah, it is, unit testing is, you give it some input and you expect some output, or you give it some input and you expect some behavior. Um, the thing with behavior here, is that JavaScript is asynchron, so you don't really have output. You rather have like side effects going on, um, or like promises. Um, so here's an example of some really simplified JavaScript unit testing, um, because it's actually not using asynchron code or something. That's a small library for to do TXT. To do TXT is like a textual format of writing your to dos. So he, Oh, I didn't change it. Um, all right, it's, it's a way to specify something you should do. So you give it a title, you give, give it some tags and some projects, and you can say when should it be finished and is it finished or not. So the X specifies whether it's finished or not. And that's just it. You write it into a text file and be done with it. But there are clients for everything. Um, so here's an example of how how to write a test for that. So this is using uh, a certain uh, way to define the tests. Um, it's called Mocha, I will talk about that later a little bit. But um, basically, the idea is really similar. You set up something, in this case, a to-do parser, and then you check um, that, so, so you set up a to-do parser and parse the string hello, and um, you check the result, which is a to-do object, and, and in this case, I check whether the text of the to-do object is hello. Um, um, it's using 
a library called Chai. Uh, Chai is an assertion library for JavaScript. Because obviously in JavaScript there's a library for everything. So even if you have a test framework, you still need an assertion framework. <laughs> Um, so yeah, when you, when you do that, and if, if you run the tests, you get, and you don't have any code yet, you get it out, uh, a wet output, um, then you write some code in order to fix that, and you write your to-do path. So in this case, it's the simplest implementation, which passes our test, which is just returning the entire string um, as our text. Um, you run it again, and it passes. And then, like in an ideal world, you would then continue with writing the other test. Um, so in this case, um, I'm specifying a priority. The cool thing is in this uh, syntax, you can have like a human descriptable name for what do you test in this case. Uh, here you specify a priority and a text, and we check whether there's a priority in the result. And then you continue, and then you fix it, and then you write another test, and by that you get this kind of loop. So um, wet means you have a failing test. You fix the failing test, and then you can refactor and improve things. And the cool thing, like when you have that kind of test afterwards, um, when you you, you, have, you want to introduce a new feature, you make it wet again. You make it write a new test, get it green again, and refactor. Um, that's the ideal world of unit testing. And the cool thing is that it's really a nice way to develop because you never leave the scope of your current work. You can just run the tests. They are immediate feedback. They give you like immediate, like, I don't know, a milli no, that's not one millisecond, but like below 100 milliseconds. So you never get distracted and you can still focus a lot on working what you actually want to achieve. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so if we, as the Drupal community, would like to test our JavaScript, there are all the possibilities. Um, so there are a couple of tools we could leverage. Um, there's first a thing called testing framework. Um, you could think of a testing framework kind of like PHP unit. Um, so there's QUnit. It currently has 3,000 downloads a week. So I would not really recommend it because it's not that. <laughs> yeah, I try to came up with the numbers in order to justify why we want something. And then there's Jasmine. And Jasmine is like a testing framework, um, which also allows you to run those tests in the browser, uh, 190K. Then there's Mocha, which is uh, Node.js based testing, 700,000. Tape is a really simple alternative. Um, all the other ones are pretty complex. Tape is pretty simple. Um, then there are test runners. Um, uh, so test runners takes a testing framework and uh, run them somewhere. Well, <laughs> intern is also a testing framework, but um, intern has just like 4,000 downloads, but it's advertisement, advertised as the hot new shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because it says it can run on CLI, on browsers, it can run on browser stack, uh, which is um, a shared, uh, it's a way to run like in a, like a cloud environment, tests in all the browsers, all the mobile phones uh, and everything at the same time. Um, so maybe in turn is actually interesting. There's also Karma, which has 350,000 downloads. Karma is uh, also a way to run Jasmine, Mocha, Tape, and QUnit tests inside your browser, in whatever browser you, you want. So I, I actually think we should go with Mocha and Karma. Um, so, in order, so Mocha basically as testing framework, and then Karma in order to actually run our tests in, uh, in the browser. Uh, another, a couple of other libraries you actually need is uh, Chai and Xeno, and you see the amount of downloads are pretty much the same, because you, they are basically required. Um, Chai is an assertion library, which allows you to check like, that a specific thing was actually done. Um, I, I will show an example later. And there's Synon, which is a mocking framework. Um, yeah, whatever. Um, here's Chai is also just like, why? Um, they have three different notations um, to define, to check whether actually something happens. 
Uh, so there's the assertion one, which is like the classical one. So assert equal, hello, as that the to do text is equal to hello. Classical one, then there's the should notation, which is to do to text, text, uh, text should equal hello. Um, they provide magic that like every JavaScript object behaves or has a should function. It's pretty crazy. And then there's the expect notation, which is also expect that a certain variable to equal hello. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't get the point. <laughs> <laughs> because assert is the shortest. And I, I <laughs> like, I, okay, the thing is, the should notation is more human friendly to read. Or the expect notation. Oh. You're expecting something to be something and then it turns out accidentally to be null. Oh, yeah, that's a good point because you cannot override the behavior of a null object. Good point. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so you just went with assert. I went with expect. Ah, okay, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you went with expect? Why did you went with expect rather than assert? Okay, fair. So, so yeah, uh, it is, I mean, like you can certainly use the metrics of less code, but there are other metrics. Like the readability aspect is not that unimportant. Um, also, when you have expect notation, you can, um, I get, I, yeah, like the test runners can also output real actual English because like two equal, they can convert that to a nicer output. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, JavaScript, I don't know. Um, um, so one problem we have in Drupal is that we mostly interact with the DOM. Um, we don't have like crazy libraries which, I don't know, um, calculate something crazy, I don't know, a React router or something, but we rather always integrate, uh, we always interact with the real world. Um, so pure unit testing is maybe a little bit too ambitious for uh, Drupal itself. So I would actually propose we use some kind of integration testing for our JavaScript, which means we need some kind of way to set up our JavaScript. So for example, we, we, we could um, have some HTML files which provides some initial output of Drupal um, together with even CSS files and um, then load our JavaScript in there and uh, test it. So for example, um, it would be like a front page with, with some content and then um, we could execute quick edit um, on that. Is it called quick edit? I think so. Um, so um, yeah, so I would actually propose to go with um, like integration tests first before we have any libraries. Um, in general, I think we should apply some criteria to the decisions we make, um, which is, uh, I mean, one criteria is feature richness, richness and flexibility. Uh, Drupal is really complex, and uh, that means that we potentially need flexibility um, where other people don't need it. And there's simplicity, um, yeah, you, you want it to be easy, and uh, also easy to understand, and best practices, um, we don't want to alienate people um, in, in Drupal. We want to teach them best practices um, because Drupal is not everything. Actually, I think Drupal is doing way too much. Um, so, yeah, here's a couple of decisions and questions we could uh, argue about now. Um, like, do we want a real browser? Do we want to test our stuff in real browsers or do we want to continue to use just PhantomJS? Uh, do we want to go with source labs or browser stack? They are both like external services which allow you to run the things in uh, different uh, environments. Um, they are both having an open source free model, so we could probably use it or at least try to use it. Um, we could also experiment with using BDD or uh, BHAT um, and not write our code to test stuff. And obviously the question is which test one on framework we want to use. Um, yeah, and there are a couple of issues and you can get involved with this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh.
uh, yeah, in, yeah, please ask and discuss. And uh, there, there, there are sprints uh, on Friday. And yeah, there's also a feedback slide. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so someone should now have to disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, one could disagree with you. Um, Gherkin works really well uh, in case you have a domain um, in which your Gherkin text can be written. Um, I'm not sure whether Drupal has a domain or whether Drupal is actually way too flexible to have like a good domain. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'm totally wrong about that point. Um, yeah, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, Gherkin is basically the, the language. Um, the, Gherkin is the idea to use human readable test, uh, text to. Yeah, exactly. So Cucumber and B. So Cucumber is basically <coughs> the, the Ruby framework to test stuff using the Gherkin language. That's the origin of the Gherkin language. And B hat is basically a PHP implementation of. Gherkin plus the testing. It's all part of the behavior driven kind of stuff. Exactly, exactly, yeah. W which is the idea to not um, define like expected output, but rather describe your system. Yeah, John? Yeah, the, the thing is you don't actually, you, yeah. yeah, I think the fundamental problem is that you don't actually have that much logic in your code. You rather just integrate existing libraries together, which is why I think we should have integration tests rather than unit tests. I don't know, like, the, the ideal way to write those integration tests. There's, like, a way where you can actually, like, um, create some fake uh, HTML and then run your JavaScript on that, or we could actually have real HTML. Um, when we have real HTML and CSS on there, we could maybe even have visual regression because we already have those fixtures. Um, yeah, there's stuff to explore there, of course. Uh, yeah? Can you go to the microphone because it's recorded? So when you use an actual browser, then it's pretty easy because you just open up the developer toolbar and click on pause. Um, 
and uh, yeah, when you use uh, Phantom JS, you can. There's this uh, ad additional parameter. Um, I don't know. It's something <laughs> dash port. So it, it opens up a debugging port, and then you can go to like your browser, and then like that, that with that port on your local host, and then you go, can go in, and you basically have the developer toolbar available, and then it loads up like the initial JavaScript of PhantomJS, and then you can put a breakpoint there, and then from there it just loads all the files you have, and then you can continue, continuously debug through your JavaScript. Oh, really cool, yeah, um, yeah, there's good documentation about that on uh, the PhantomJS uh, page. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, you can load uh, any kind of library you want. Okay. So it's not only for unit testing, it's also for integration but testing. Will it cascade yeah. and run the tests on that library? Oh, oh, that is what you're saying. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you can configure Karma to do that as well. But I'm not sure whether I get the point of it, because those open source projects already test their stuff. Uh, okay. So we wanted to see is there a difference that's causing that rather than just trying to update our Oh, okay. We just need to lock to version 111.27. Oh, that's an interesting. Well, but I, I, I would assume that they are tests one all the time. I don't think they do, into, uh, they add uh, like regressions in like some minor versions, but they, they rather just don't catch it. Okay. So I, I think like you should just have enough tests for your actual site or library or something to um, ensure that like when jQuery is broken you also see it. Oh yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> so uh, question about it. You proposed something about uh, HTML fixtures. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We we could do that, um, or we we actually say it's okay to not keep them up to date um, because we have the stable theme, and if we generate our HTML with the stable theme, we are supposed to not change the HTML with the stable theme. So, um, <coughs> given that, we would ensure that our stable uh, code always works. That code is working with our stable. Maybe we need to have like both both pictures. Um, actually, we should do that because, um, like, we shouldn't rely on the HTML output, but rather have like data attributes to select stuff rather than CSS classes. Um, I, we are going there. I'm not sure whether we are completely there, but uh, yeah. All right. Anyone, anyone else? Cool. Yeah, squints and feedback. Thank you.